All of this clearly stands within a tradition of renunciation that does seem to recall certain recurrent themes in medieval Christian piety. One thinks, for instance, of the wandering friars in Christendom. Perhaps they're quite similar to these wandering dervishes that, that were such a common feature of life in medieval Muslim cities. But there is a fundamental difference to bear in mind between Christian and classical Muslim understandings of renunciation. The word, by the way, for renunciation is zuhud. Literally means just not having something. Um, famous story about um, how one has to renounce the world and one's attachment to the world from the famous Ibrahim ibn Adham, the prince of the city of Balkh in Central Asia. One night, we are told, he heard a strange sound on the roof of his palace. The servants found a man who claimed to be looking for his lost camel on the palace roof. Blamed by the prince for having undertaken such an impossible task, the man answered that Ibrahim's attempt at maintaining a true religious life in the midst of luxury was no less absurd as the search for a camel on top of a roof. So Ibrahim, of course, duly repents and gives up his kingdom. And he, in, his, in Muslim piety, is the archetype of the wandering um, poor man who is the lover of God. But the distinction between this and medieval Christian conceptions of renunciation has to bear in mind the fact that the Quran has its own very distinctive understanding of the nature of the world. The world is ultimately a manifestation of divine love and the various Christian interpretations of the fallenness of the world were not carried over into Islam. So we find that Muslim asceticism has in practice been rather more muted than versions of asceticism that you will find, say, amongst the desert fathers of the church or in some forms of, of Hindu piety, the great feats of renunciation that one associates with them. Note also that there's no real monastic tradition in Islam. These places, the Zawiyas, or in Persia, the Khan Qas, are meeting places for um, the brethren of a particular spiritual tradition. People may live in them temporarily. Nonetheless, they are not monasteries, in as much as um, Islam assumes that following a spiritual life is not ultimately incompatible with also making one's way through the world, earning a living and supporting a family. So to be a religious person simply dependent upon the charity of others or on the, um, the largesse of an institution is something that, that is frowned on in Islam. Now perhaps the sharpest distinction is of course the attitude to sexuality. Celibacy in Muslim piety is particularly frowned upon. And here we see a big distinction between medieval Muslim and medieval Christian understandings of the, the ideal pious life. As is well known, Christian piety, until very recently, um, is, was very cautious about the sex drive of fallen humanity. Virginity was prized as the normal attribute of a saint. And one of the most characteristic features in, in traditional Catholic hagiography particularly is the person who renounces sexuality, renounces the body, lives a purified uh, spiritual, non-physical existence. So for instance, Gregory of Nyssa stated that if the life which is promised to the just by the Lord after the resurrection is similar to that of angels and release from marriage is a particular characteristic of the angelic nature, then the virgin has already received some of the beauties of the promise. If you look at um, uh, Peter Brown's book, uh, The Body and Society, uh, you'll see a very large number of examples of uh, the, the patristic and early medieval Christian um, desire to distance themselves from the... the uh, from the sexual drive. Islam's understanding, however, is that the celestial life of the blessed can't entail the deprivation of any of the God-given sources of delight which existed in this world, provided that they brought no harm upon others. The Quranic heaven, in fact, is strongly eroticized. <clears throat> Hence, celibacy on this earth can be no more than some kind of provisional strategy for the spiritual warrior. There's no long-term ideal of celibacy anywhere in Muslim piety. And of course, this received further confirmation from the example of the prophet himself. He said, marriage is my way, my sunnah, and whoever diverges from my way is not of me. 
And in, an, in another, even more explicit hadith, <coughs> we find the Prophet saying, in the sexual act of each of you, there is a charity. Even that is regarded as a good, um, benign expression of um, the religious and moral life, rather than something that is, is problematic. And in fact, one of the most consistent assumptions of Muslim writers on the spiritual um, life has been that the path to God more or less requires an active marital life. The Muslim saints characteristically are married, they are not celibates. And lust as such doesn't appear in the usual Muslim lists of deadly sins. In fact, we even find a, a very lively tradition of medieval scholars, um, both Kalam scholars and jurists and Sufis, writing <clears throat> what would nowadays be described as, as, as pillow books, explaining, for instance, the importance of, of such supposedly recent discoveries as contraception and female sexual satisfaction, emphasized very much in, in the Hadith. It's very substantial literature. Now, some even more adventurous souls even went so far as to weave this very positive view of human sexuality into their cosmology, seeing the sexual act as a kind of sacramental reminder <coughs> of the reconciliation and harmony of the beautiful and the majestic aspects of the divine. So in this view, the Jamal and the Jalal can be seen as a very broad parallel of the female and the male principles um, in the divine. So Islam's attitude to sexuality is consistent with the religion's underlying conviction that the world itself is fundamentally good. Nonetheless, the spiritual writers do acknowledge that since the spiritual path requires the strict renunciation of the inward vices, <coughs> such as covetousness, avarice, love of status, etc., then the treatment of these sicknesses may well require this kind of temporary abstinence from some of the things of the world. Um, hence this principle of faqr. So one can renounce wealth, renounce property, pro um, property and so forth. Although the renunciation of sexuality is very rarely a theme in, in mainstream medieval Muslim piety. So we find that the medieval spiritual directors will say that to rid oneself of the vice of avarice, you have to give away your worldly goods as much as you can, without, of course, compromising your, your family responsibilities, until you become indifferent to <coughs> property, seeing it only as a means to an end. Love of status has to be combated by wearing simple clothes, um, avoiding positions of public esteem or, or prominence, <coughs> and in general, leaving, leading a pretty inconspicuous sort of life. Um, common advice is be a sparrow among birds. But the world itself is not condemned. <clears throat> it is worldliness that is the snare, not the world itself. So we find a lot of cases of religious Muslims who rise to stations of, of, of considerable <clears throat> success by the standards even of worldly people, but whose spiritual life remains vibrant. Um, an early Baghdad mystic called Al Junaid said, asceticism is for the heart to be empty of what the hand is empty of. <clears throat> so renunciation of the world may be a temporary state, but it is not necessarily a condition for a saint <clears throat> that he be poor or rich because he has actually uh, transcended any love of the world and is hence indifferent of what might be set before him or what might not. <clears throat> 